What came first? The music or the misery? People worry about kids playing with guns or watching violent videos. Some sort of culture of violence will take them over. Nobody worries about kids listening to thousands, literally thousands of songs about heartbreak, rejection, pain, misery, and loss. Did I listen to pop music because I was miserable? Or was I miserable because I listened to pop music? The Plot Holic Podcast is not meant to make light of those with an actual serious addiction. If you have an actual serious addiction, the Plot Holic Podcast should not be used as a replacement for treatment. If you are not in a treatment program for substance abuse, and you are somehow still offended, then fuck you too. Sincerely, your host. Take a trip with us to New Park. Just promise not to drink the goo. Oh my god! If you get sucked into the Matrix, Matrix. we will send a phone for you. Do you believe in fate? But every movie has a plot hole. And every hole gets filled somehow. Like uh, your opinion, man. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another hey, episode Val. of the Plotaholics. I'm Shane Wilson, and I'm a Plotaholic. And I'm Brian. Oh, hi, Shane. Hi, Brian. And I'm Brian Tan, and I'm a Plotaholic. Brian, I am zero days sober because oh, yeah. today I watched. The John Cusack classic exclamation point. High exclamation fidelity. point. Um, absolutely. Uh, high fidelity. The story of Rob Gordon, the record store owner, uh, jilted lover, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'll tell you. And this is an amazing start to our summer of Cusack. Yeah. It truly is. Now, I have to admit, I had not seen High Fidelity at first because when I first heard about it, I just saw a record store owner and I was just like, you know what? All this is is Empire Records, but with John Cusack. And I passed it by. Yeah. How wrong I was. Yeah, man. Uh, it's... <sighs> I don't I want to take a take a journey back to when you would go to the store and just buy as many DVDs as you could uh, without really even knowing what they were about. Sometimes, you know, when uh, I don't know if where you lived, like, like the blockbuster would maybe have a used DVD sale once a year. Yeah. Sidewalk well, sale. Yeah. I, I recall those quite. Quite you can just you just walk in and throw down a, a like a twenty dollar bill and walk away with so many DVDs, Absolutely. and I think if I'm not mistaken, this is how I discovered High Fidelity was in, in a situation like that because I didn't know uh, the movie. It wasn't uh, something that really registered as it wasn't. I don't really remember it being marketed very widely. Uh, it was kind of a sleeper, I think. Yeah, I, I, that, that sounds about right, because I only knew about it because, you know, there, there was a long time ago for you guys that are listening that are relatively young that we didn't have the Internet. And they had a channel that had a constant scroll that showed you what was on. It's basically it's just like the guide on your cable box now except it had its own channel. And on this channel, they showed film trailers and different advertisements. So I would see the trailer for High Fidelity. Right. And like I said, I've always I always liked John Cusack, but like I said, when I 
saw this, like I said, I thought this was just Empire Records, but with John Cusack. So I kind of left it alone. And like I said, I, I really wish that I hadn't. I really um, wish that I would have checked it out. Yeah. So it was released in uh, opening weekend for High Fidelity was the weekend of March 31st to April 2nd of 2000. Yeah. Uh, and the films that it opened against or that were at least in the theater at the time included movies like Aaron Brockovich, uh, <laughs> Romeo Must Die, American Beauty, which would go on to win a slew of Academy Awards, uh, Final Destination, Mission to Mars, uh, there was Cider a House Rules. Com- yeah. Oh, and that was a great movie. Cider House Rules was a great movie. In a- so there, there was a lot of good stuff that was coming oh, out the this sixth, time. The Sixth Sense, The oh, Green Mile, yes. these two movies were still, they had been out for a little while, but they were still in theaters. So, I think High Fidelity maybe just got lost in the noise. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. Because, I mean, well, you figure with the Green Mile and um, and um, Sixth Sense alone. The Sixth Sense was a... It was every. It was a phenomenon. It truly was. And, you know, seeing dead people and Bruce Willis. And, and that twist was like unlike anything that we'd really seen in a while. Yeah, who would have thought that Mark Wahlberg was Bruce Willis the whole time? Right. I I definitely never saw that coming. You know what else surprised me? Uh, that Bruce Willis was uh, Rachel Green's father. Wow, yeah, that threw me for a loop. Trying to keep the Friends references sneaking into our podcast as well. <laughs> well, considering the fact that we did that in abundance in our last show. Right. Well, <laughs> I think it's amazing. And what's great is that we can actually find that reference into this. Coo freaking does. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, let's see. High Fidelity directed by Stephen Frears. Uh, was made on a $30 million budget and made $47.1 million at the box office. So, it, so. well, it's still, it kind of, well, you figure for the time, it probably still kind of lost money because you figure with um, marketing and so forth, it, right. probably, it probably took a very, very modest um, profit if it made money at all. But name, but based off a book, by uh, Nick Hornby, yes, um, a British a British novel, which I do intend on getting, or I want to see if maybe it's an audio book. I'll tell you this book, and it's been a while since I read. So, a High Fidelity, the movie is maybe, and we've talked about this off air, my favorite film of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, High Fidelity, the novel is is up there for me as well. Like it's in the top ten probably for me. Uh, it's not my favorite novel of all time, but it's up there. It's very good. I've only read it once, and it's been a while. But what is so interesting, and this, and it, and it offers us a really nice uh, entryway into a conversation about adaptation, Absolutely. because uh, the the novel is set in London, and the movie is set in Chicago. In Chicago. Yeah, and, and that's amazing. That, that that's an amazing shift right there. Right. And what's even crazier is that Nick Hornby likes this movie. He truly does, because he even went on to say that after seeing this movie and with the narration and everything, he was like, wow, John Cusack read my book. Right. Yes. Yeah. And and it really and having read the novel, there are times when it feels like the script is being taken right out of the page. And that's something that even though they took great liberty in, in moving the location, the this for the movie to still read like the book and still hold on to the emotional center of the book, uh, I think is 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 an achievement for everybody involved. And absolutely, and it's so good. And and we and I want to talk at some point, uh, probably before we leave, and I should make a note of it uh, about how Chicago factors into this as a character. Uh, the the mm-hmm. city dynamic is an, is an interesting choice to put it in this kind of city and and it could have been new york it could have been anywhere else you know but chicago and the way that you know that city adds to the texture of this film is something that i want to talk about and and that's just great filmmaking and i think that and this was around the time when you had book adaptations that did not 
follow the source material very well at all. Yeah. And this one did, not to mention the fact that and you're absolutely right, how it was able to make the city a character in the film. It wasn't just a background. Yeah. And and I'll tell you, it, it was very well done. That's amazing filmmaking, great storytelling. But if you but you know, if you're well as we talk about this movie, besides John Cusack, who's always gold. So good. We have to talk about some of our some of the other actors. And I'm gonna butcher this lady's name, but Ibn has <laughs> Robin Wright from another country. Right. Um, other Robin Wright. That's Danish Robin Wright. Can we call her that? Yeah, you're talking about the 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 woman that plays uh, Laura. Laura. Laura, right? Our female lead. Yes, she had. She is very good in this movie. Yeah. Um, Even looks like Hegel to me from Copenhagen. Ah, uh, she's from Copenhagen. Yeah. Oh, I hear they have great dip and they have a uh, great chewing tobacco there. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, would, it would seem that someone has at least played off of that assumption. <laughs> what I really like about her performance as Laura is that at one point, she's the girlfriend, she's the ex-girlfriend of your best friend, where you're like, that bitch. Yeah. But you start to see her points more and more, and you start to actually sympathize with the you start to take the mindset of the Liz character played by John's big sister, Joan. Yeah. Let, before we go too far down this list. Yeah. Let's hit uh, the uh, plot synopsis. Let's do that. You're right. Uh, so that we can, so everybody has at least the a working knowledge of what is uh, going on here. Uh, this is from IMDB and it is a gross oversimplification, but it'll at least give you what, what we're working with. Rob, who is the John Cusack character, a record store owner and compulsive list maker, recounts his top five breakups, including the one in progress. Um, and the lists and the top fives become a, a, a motif and a, a plot device that I think is used to great effect. Oh, absolutely. And it's and it's so hilarious. The list even of itself is a character. And yeah. it's and it, it challenges Jack Black for the most hilarious character in the film. Yeah, here's a, a slightly better synopsis. This one is uh, and I'm not 100 percent sure, but it's probably from Wikipedia. Uh, Rob Gordon is the owner of a failing record store in Chicago where he sells music the old fashioned way on vinyl. Although they have an encyclopedic knowledge of pop music and are consumed by the music scene, it's of no help to Rob, whose needle skips the love groove when his longtime girlfriend, Laura, walks out on him. As he examines his failed attempts at romance and happiness, the process finds him being dragged kicking and screaming into adulthood. That is a very, very good synopsis. Yeah, it is. And, and one of the things that they truly don't, and I think they touch on it very, very well in amazing storytelling, is that really this is a story about a boy who never grew up, a very, very immature um, narcissist. Yes. And someone who is, uh, and, and we'll talk a lot about self-sabotage and we'll talk a lot about, Oh my God. Um, I was screaming self-sabotage <laughs> all while I was watching this. It's, you know, Rob is, is a guy like a lot of guys, I think who is afraid of growing up because of what that means in terms of commitment, uh, and, having to face your success and or failure, Rob is ultimately afraid of dreaming uh, yes. and, and afraid of, you know, uh, it, it, as he recounts his story, you notice that uh, he often uses language like, so I woke up six months later and I owned a record store, right? Uh, yeah. Nothing ever happens to Rob because Rob wanted it to. It always just happens to him. Right. <laughs> and that and that's one of the things about Rob that's actually some of his charms is that it's like, oh, well, I wish that I could just wake up and own a record store because there was a time where all I wanted to do was own a record, a, mo a new and used 
movie and record store. So oh, I could yeah. just talk movies and music. Right. All and day. again, I feel like I, I have always talked about how John Cusack plays the everyman so well in almost anything he does, in, at least in this genre. Right. And I and, wonder if this is just him playing himself because it's so effortless. Well, yeah, there's there is that for sure. But in this movie, he's like peak every man, peak every man, because I see myself in in Rob uh, and so do I. In, Right. Yeah. And, it, and maybe not. Maybe we've grown past the the trials that he's going through in, in over the course of the film. But we've definitely been there. Absolutely. Uh, and we've we've ruined things with a good woman who wanted nothing but to love us. Uh -huh. uh, we've been, we've sabotaged ourselves because we were afraid of our own success. Uh, you know, it's it's something that this movie just captures in such a interesting and real sort of way. And it uses a device that often bothers me, but is executed so well in this film. And that is the breaking the fourth wall. Uh, <laughs> the the fact that Rob talks to us so much uh, would normally talks, bother me. Yeah, but he, t he talks to us more than Zach Morris does. He does, yeah, absolutely. And and it normally would bother me, but it's so well done in it this. It works. It just works. And His delivery is just so conversational, and and like it feels like you're just talking to a dude, you know? Exactly. And I think that a lot of the charms that come from Rob are his flaws. Yeah. And he really just. You know, I think this is one of those films, and I almost lost this thought, and I'm glad it came back. I think every young man, the age from between the age of 16 and 23, mm -hmm. should be made to watch this film at least once a year. Yeah. Because this is the quintessential movie about growing up. Well, and I'm telling you, and this is no lie, I don't know when this tradition started for me, but I've watched this film right at once a year since I was probably 18 or 19. Well, I think that I'm going to start doing that with this film as well, watching it at least once a year because yeah, I, it really I'm, resonates. Yeah, I missed it when it came out. In 2000, I would have been in like ninth or 10th grade. Uh, but whenever I caught it at one of those you know, sidewalk sales, since the first time I watched it, it's just spoken to me on on so many levels. And part of it is that like I said, I can see myself in Rob. He is his self-deprecating humor is the way that I talk about myself. You know, it's same here. <laughs> uh, and so there, there's some really uh, great moments. So let's uh, let's get into the breakdown here. And uh, well, you were actually working your way through the cast, so let's get back to that. Let's let's go to your boy Jack Black. Jack Black, and this is still early Jack Black. Yeah plays Barry Judd along with Todd Luiso who plays Dick. Todd Luiso also played the male nanny in Jerry Maguire. I did not have to look that up to know that one. Right. But you these know, two guys literally and John Cusack and Rob even says in the film, they just showed up one day and then all of a sudden they just worked here. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. They, they're just two dudes that love music and they just came through and would talk to him. Uh, and then they just kept showing up. And so mm -hmm. they just ended up working there, kind of. Yeah. And Jack Black is Barry Judd. He is that stereotypical new and used record store guy who always feels like he knows more about music than you and is a complete dick about it. Yeah. And for the and record... Exactly a high fidelity is Jack one of Jack Black's first credited roles. It's before almost anything else. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something right now. This is this is Jack Black in such a great cuz I mean let's look at some of the things Jack Black did before this if if you don't mind. Absolutely. The movie Bob Roberts, which I never even heard of. Right. His first film role in 1992. Don't care. Yeah, Airborne. it looks like the only thing that he's actually credited with is as himself in Biodome. Yeah, because Demolition Man, which is one of which is one of my favorite summer popcorn flicks of all time, you don't even see, you only see him on film for a split second. I did actually notice him in the movie. Yeah, 
but it's a blink and you miss it. Mm-hmm. Waterworld. Who the fuck saw Waterworld? <laughs> well, and anybody who saw Waterworld definitely didn't see Jack Black in it. Exactly. Dead Man Walking. Never saw it. Biodome. You only, he's, and he's credited as himself as in Tenacious D. Right. The first time he actually has a role of any real sustenance is in 1996 in The Cable Guy. Right. As uh, Matthew Broderick's friend Rick. That and for those of you who saw it, he's the guy that um, Jim Carrey runs up his back to dunk and break the backboard. Mm. And then he went on in that same year to do the fan with um, Wesley Snipes. So that's twice he was in a Wesley Snipes film. Then Mars Attacks, then Crosswords. Once again, a bunch of movies that like are forgettable. I mean, yeah, I still and, know and, what you did last summer. Forgettable. Well, yeah, and all of these movies are forgettable, and his roles in them are even more forgettable. But when you get to High Fidelity, and he busts into that record store for the first time, he is unignorable. He, yeah. yeah, like this is Jack Black at his Jack Blackiest, you know? Yes, it is. Because then a year later, he would go on to be J.D. McNugent in Saving Silverman, yep. and then Shallow How. And that so the high fidelity is really his arrival, but it's also his the breakout. first time that he's given anything of substance to really do. Exactly. And Jack Black, he and he has the most recognizable face yeah. of anyone in Hollywood. Just that look. Like he with that smile, dude, he could be the Joker if he wanted to be. Yeah. But um, um so, yeah, and go then, ahead down your list. Yeah, and then you've got, and I hate to be rude and say it, but the almost forgettable Todd Luiso as the unassuming dick, who is actually like he's afraid of his own shadow. But yeah. he's that he's that quiet guy that he may seem creepy, but once you become friends, he's your creep. Yeah, he's uh he's the guy that um that probably didn't have a ton of friends growing up, and that's why he latches on to the record store because these are his people. It's something to, it's like video gamers today, right? The people yeah. you, you've finally found somebody that can talk to you about the things that you're interested in. It's the and, one place he belongs. Right. And so it's his, his character arc in this film is really great. And I, I uh, enjoy seeing him sort of come into his own as well through the, through the film. Well, I think in this entire movie, this entire movie is about growth. And yes. all of the characters in this film grow. And the ones that don't are the ones that aren't really all that important. They're just there as background. And that's the one thing that I really enjoy because I think it really shows the whole people coming into your life for a season philosophy. Yeah. Now, this uh, for sure, this movie like crushes that idea uh, in terms of how it dis- – through uh, the the narrative framework that is established uh, from the top, really, of Rob telling the stories of his top five worst breakups. Oh, man. And the one that really sucks is his breakup with Charlie, played by Catherine Zeta-Jones. Yeah, who is perfectly cast. Oh, she really is. And she is so gorgeous. She is another one of these people that don't look like they've aged. Right. Yeah. So beautiful. And I really Catherine just Zeta Jones. Yeah. Catherine Zeta Jones. Have you ever I, seen Workaholics? No, I have not. There's I mean, this this is a super random tangent. Okay. Uh, but I think that we're probably going to become known for our random tangents. Uh, <laughs> there's a scene in a work so workaholics, the premise is like these three dudes that just work at a telemarketing company. Okay. Uh, and so they decide one night it's a stoner series essentially on comedy central okay. it has a what's his name adam um not, nope adam not not driver adam devine adam divine uh and it and a couple of other dudes that you would know for sure if you saw them uh but anyway so there's a there's an episode where they stay at work after hours they are going to go quote unquote camping in the cubicles okay and they're going to drop mushrooms nice and so they all get high off their ass right and then they start to like get paranoid that the the tech people that have come in to work on the computers after hours are some kind of secret government agency 
And so they reenact the scene from Entrapment where Catherine Zeta-Jones is sliding under those lasers. Uh, oh, I know who these guys are. Yeah. And so, I saw like, their movie on Netflix. Yeah. So Adam Devine's character, like, just high off of his ass, he just starts singing. He goes, Catherine Zeta-Jones <laughs> slides beneath lasers. <laughs> Oh man, and I actually hear the uh the saxophone in the back. <laughs> right. I love it. Uh but yeah, so she is excellent and he he counts down his top 5 and he starts in chronological order, which is his uh he's a he's a little neurotic too in the way that he organizes things and the way that his brain sort of processes information, a rob I'm talking about. Yeah. Um because there's a scene early on where he's where him and Laura have broken up and Dick comes over to invite him out and he's reorganizing his record collection. And yeah. Dick asks him, he says, is this alphabetical? And he says, no. And he says, well, it's not chronological. And he says, no. He says, well, what is it? And Rob says, it's autobiographical. <laughs> like he organizes his records based on what they mean to him at his life in that time. And so every time his life changes, he reorganizes the records. That is amazing. That is an amazing premise. That is such an amazing, that is such an idiosyncratic routine. I love it. And, and that is the exact kind of just little quirks that these characters are painted with that make them feel like real people. Absolutely, because we all know that person that sort of has something like that. Like me, I, I arrange my films in alphabetical order, but I will suddenly and randomly change said alphabetical order, and I'll include either actors or directors. Yeah. So I'll have like all the Kevin Smith movies in the S section. Yeah. So that that is great. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. So we'll we'll take it to the top here and we'll we'll break down this thing because uh there's no better way to do it and it's a movie that is <laughs> that's so organized that you hate to uh because it's all lists, you know, you hate to not respect that. Um so he uh, the the movie opens with um this with with the breakup essentially right. um, that Laura and uh, Laura is moving out of their apartment and we don't know yet where she's going, but she's moving out. Right. Uh, and when she leaves, he screams out the window at her. You, if you wanted to really hurt me, you should have gotten to me sooner, uh, <laughs> which is an amazing line for a breakup. Uh, <laughs> and, then uh, after she leaves, he sits down and talks to the camera a little bit. And he um, he essentially sets up the premise of, of the first half of the film, which is that we're going to work our way through the top five worst breakups he's gone through in chronological order. And we start with this uh, with his first relationship. And he and I cannot remember it right now, but he says that it was for two and a half days for three hours for the three hours after school <laughs> yeah and we've Un all been there because right. i had a very similar quote unquote relationship when i was about the character's age which he was like 12 or 13 and that was with the girl who we went to the same we had been to the baby same babysitter all of our lives yeah i want to play this part because the way okay. he, so we're gonna do the clip there that's the first relationship because i want to hear i want the part where he establishes how he's going to talk about it and then i also want where he's like one year they weren't there and then the next year we couldn't ignore them they were everywhere and they had grown breasts <laughs> <laughs> which brings us to number one on the top five all-time breakup list allison ashmore <laughs> one moment they weren't there not in any form that interested us anyway and then the next, you couldn't miss them. They were everywhere. And they'd grown breasts. And we wanted... Actually, we didn't even know what we wanted. But it was something interesting. Disturbing, even. 
my relationship with Alison Ashmore lasted for six hours. For two hours after school, before the Rockford Files, for three days in a row. But on the fourth afternoon, Kevin Bannister. Slut. So he uh, has this relationship with this girl for, like we said, a couple of days. And then he walks over to meet her again to make out some more. And, and she's with another guy. Right. And that is how it, that's how things sort of used to play out when you were in seventh or eighth grade. Right. And I, I love the fact how, as a grown man, that makes his top five breakups. Right. I think that's hilarious. It's like, wow, dude. You still haven't been able to let that one go. Yeah, and so I, when I when I think back over my top five breakups, I don't think that you know what. Yeah, I, there's an eighth grade breakup that gets in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I will tell you the quick story okay. of a girl whose name I will not say on the podcast. <laughs> okay. In the eighth grade, I w- I allowed myself to to be publicly into girls. You know, when you're a young man, you're like, oh, I don't like girls, whatever. You know, like, that's, like, I don't know why we are like yeah, that when I, we're very young. But... Honestly, I never had that. I was always in, just into them. Well, but... I was always into them too, but I always pretended that I wasn't, right? Like, because I didn't want, like, the worst thing that could have happened to me in fifth grade was that somebody found out that I had a crush on Aaron Smith, you know? Like... Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just that that shy, I don't want to be put on blast or, or whatever. But anyway, so in the eighth grade, there was this girl. Let's call her mm, Kathy. That's not her name, but we'll call her that. Fair enough. And I don't know why I thought Kathy was cute. In hindsight, she was kind of plain. But maybe I had a very realistic idea of what my league was. And uh, I knew where I was batting, you know? <laughs> so uh, I went after Kathy with some of the most heartfelt fucking letter writing that you've ever read in your fucking life. Uh, <laughs> and she said, no. And that didn't hurt so bad. Right. Because I knew I was going to break her down, you know? Right. And so I tried again a little bit later on, you know, after we had gotten to know each other some and, you know, we flirted a little bit. And so this time she comes around, she's like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Let's, I'll, I will be your girlfriend. And I'm like, yeah, there we go. On Valentine's Day, I got Kathy a stuffed Beanie Baby Frog because frogs were her favorite. And Kathy didn't get me anything for Valentine's Day. Wow, what a and, jerk. Yeah, and at the end of the day on Valentine's Day, with my stuffed frog in her hand, she broke up with me and then went and got in her mom's van and drove away. Wow. So that one has stuck with me. <laughs> I wonder where she is now and if, like, she, if fate has gotten back at her. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. But that was, that was a tough one. And, uh, and I, and after that, the majority of the tough ones came as an adult, you know, like the high school relationships never hurt me too much. Um, but I think that first love always stings a little bit because you've never felt that kind of, that particular brand of pain before. And so, um, I can understand why Rob still registers this one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. That that I I can understand that. It's like just, Cheryl it's Crow said, man, the first cut is the deepest. Baby, I know. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Right. Yeah, so, and it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. You're right. Well, I was being because a what's too what's interesting is he he goes through his top five and he gets to the he gets to number five, and he says. And, you know, her, our breakup was pretty mutual and no one really got hurt and it really was a non-event. And that's sort of what happens as we get older. Like we, we have a lot more relationships and sometimes they just don't work out. And those don't hurt nearly as bad as the ones when we were young, when everything felt like the world was ending. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. So this girl uh, is, is his first love. And then she starts making out with what was his name? Chad Bannister or something? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, oh man, what that's such a horrible name, but I right. Love. And I'm not really sure that that's 100% correct, accurate. Well, it is now. Yeah, He's... Bannister was, I'm pretty sure Bannister was his last name. Um, and so then, uh, the second girl was his high school girlfriend, and he was a dick for this one, man. Yeah, this was no good. This is a bad look for Rob. It truly is. And I think this is the first time where you're kind of like, 
maybe Laura had a point. Right. At the same time, this top five list, and this is why, so I just said why I think the like middle school relationship should have made the cut. But here's a second sort of narrative reason why I think it's really important to show us the middle school and the high school relationships before we see the adult relationships, because it's a quick way for the movie to show us how much Rob has grown and how little he's grown. Absolutely. And I think it also goes to show you got the early seeds sown for his, his self-destructive behavior. Yeah. And he, he has this bitterness in him that a lot of people carry uh, because they feel like the world has cheated them in some way. And uh, this high school girlfriend, and again, I can't remember uh, this character's name right off, but he, they make out a lot. And absolutely. Uh, but every time he tries to take it to the next level, uh, she shuts him down. Right. And so he eventually there's this night and I want to play this clip too, because it's another really good one Absolutely. where she says, do you want to come in? And he, well, we'll just play it. Yeah. She was so nice. In fact, that she wouldn't let me put my hand underneath or even on top of her bra. Attack and defense, invasion and repulsion. It was as if breasts were little pieces of property that had been unlawfully annexed by the opposite sex. They were rightfully ours and we wanted them back. Sometimes I got so bored of trying to touch her breast that I would try to touch her between her legs. It was like trying to borrow a dollar, getting turned down and asking for 50 grand instead. I wasn't interested in Penny's nice qualities, just breasts, and therefore she was no good to me. What's the point? It never goes anywhere. <laughs> yeah, he is such a dick. He really is. Oh, he never goes anywhere. Seriously, dude. Right. Like, when, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, wow. Yeah. You're a piece of all. Oh, you suck, dude. Yeah. You are Zach Morris. You're trash. So. <laughs> yeah. And he, this is not a good moment for Rob, but this is one of the moments where, in hindsight, after you get to the end of this thing and you look back, you appreciate this movie for not sugarcoating these moments because it does make Rob a complex and three-dimensional character. And I was just getting ready to say that he, he's, he's three, he's a third dimensional character at this point. He has his flaws and they are a many. Yeah. But it doesn't and he's take not, from and, 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 and I think the, the biggest difference between high school Rob and the Rob telling us the story is that adult Rob is aware of his flaws. He knows that he was a dick. And he accepts them. He, he right. truly... He, he, but he doesn't seem to, at this point, when he's telling the story, he doesn't seem to grasp where he was wrong. It's like, yeah, I'm an asshole. But it actually took... And I'm jumping ahead in the film here, and I yeah. apologize, but it takes him sitting down to lunch with this woman to realize how much of a shithead he was. Right. And then, yes. but but then he also get his gets his comeuppance with his number three on his list, uh -huh. which is the Catherine Zeta Jones character. Catherine Zeta Jones, <laughs> uh, who he meets in college, and he and, already says she is like way oh, outside. My his God, league. Brian! Like, huh, the. <laughs> And she really is, man. Is it it's true that we've all had this moment too? Because I've one hundred percent batted out of my league before, oh, and yeah. and when that relationship ended, it fucking sucked. <laughs> yeah, because it's like you knew it was coming, right? But it still kicks you in the face because it's like, man, that was cold, right? Yeah, and, I, and I've had mine that was way outside my league. I'll share my story. She lived and she lived. In a different location than I did. She went to a different school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, she really did. And, um, but she was probably, now, a lot of the women that I've dated, you know, before this person, I'd probably say if I was on a scale of one to 10, not to be a misogynist sounding person, but they were like, you know, sixes, sevens, you know, nothing, but, you know, just 
that they, they wouldn't be considered like, you know, wow. But I thought they were awesome. This girl was a 10. And when I say 10, I mean, you think of what you would look at as a 10. I mean, she had jet black hair that was long and thick because she was part, I think she was part Micmac or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. But she had like, you know, the perfectly rounded cheekbones, almond shaped eyes, dark brown. She was tall and she was curvaceous, but she was, not overly curvy. Yeah. She, she was a 10. She was a banger. I, she was a banger. Like, <laughs> it wouldn't be surprised if I flipped through a magazine one day and flipped through, like, Maxim, and yeah. there she was. Right. Yeah. And and the same goes for, for my count, for my equivalent, too, where you, sometimes when, I'm, when, I, when you see, like, uh, Instagram models or influencers or whatever, Mm-hmm. sometimes I have to look twice because I'm like, is that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, because yeah. I, and it, and it's wild that, uh, that this movie is able to sort of hit on all of the types of relationships that we have because he was with her. Uh, he was, well, I'm sorry to finish. Uh, I, I cut your story off. Well, that's all right. But no, no, I'm dying to hear what happened with you and Catherine Zeta Jones. <laughs> Basically, what ended up happening between me and my Catherine Zeta-Jones was that her mom kind of gotten in the way and she cheated on me with some guy that she knew. Yeah. And then she actually went on to marry that guy and have a kid and have a kid with him. Yeah. But at the time, and I, I looked her up maybe three years ago, three, four years ago before I met Sharon. Yeah. And she and I started talking again. And then all of a sudden, I was blocked. So her husband found out about us talking. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that is, that's pretty similar to what happens with Rob and, and his Catherine Zeta Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, I don't want to get too far ahead either, but the payoff of this is so good. But we will save it because we're getting there. Uh, so he's he he dates Catherine Zeta Jones in college for a while. They she's super hot, of course. Um, and Smart, sexy, fun, everything that he's not. And he's like, this is going to end eventually. So it was, it was almost like he was just sitting and waiting. Well, and what's 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 wild is he calls a shot, right? He's like, I always knew that she was going to cheat on me with somebody that she works with and what happened she cheated on me with somebody she works with exactly and she he's yelling at her window from the street and she's just naked in the window and the guy just comes up pulls her away from the window and just you know bang the hell they they bang the holy hell out of each other absolutely uh and i want to play that scene where he is outside the window uh because oh it's great because (laughs) this is sort of Rob's move. He likes to stand in the street in the rain and yell at windows. And I was intimidated by other men in her design department and became convinced she was going to leave me for one of them. And she left me for one of them. The dreaded Marco. Charlie! You fucking bitch! Let's work it out! Just open the fucking door! Charlie! Let's talk it. Talk. Yeah, I was just getting ready to say, why is it that almost every aspect of this man in this movie, he is in the rain at someone's window? Why the hell hasn't he died from pneumonia by now? Yeah, I mean, it's Chicago, right? <laughs> Seriously, you are going to die if you are out in the rain in Chicago like yeah, that. He is in the rain a lot in this movie, for sure. Um, and this is just one of those examples. The fourth relationship on Rob's list is one that is kind of sad. Um, and this is the girl that they had both been hurt recently and they just yeah. kind of fell into a relationship with each other out of convenience. Mm-hmm. Uh, they both, you sort of get the sense that they were both rebounding off of each other. Right. And then it just, and once again, it ends now, I feel bad to say that this part of that relation, when he came up to this part, it interested me the least because this woman was not, uh, she wasn't, 
there was nothing about her. She she wasn't a sympathetic character. She didn't have a lot of charisma to keep my attention. Right. And I kind and I think they did that on purpose. She was basically a female Rob. Right. Well, especially at the moment where they found each other, because they were both reeling. And when you listen to them talk to each other, she her cadence and her tone is very similar to his. Absolutely. Uh, and they have similar stories. They're both getting out of relationships with people that were probably out of their league. And, you know, they, they're just all very woe was me. And as is often the case in, in relationships like that, uh, it's only going to hurt if you're not the one that ends it. Uh, because I don't think that Rob loved this girl. I think that, I think, yeah. And, and she moves on. And so he is hurt by that. But I feel like if he had found someone before she did and he moved on, then she would have been the one that got hurt, you know, and a lot of a lot of relationships in your early 20s sort of go that way where it's not going to work out. And you both might know that, but it's whoever pulls the trigger is, you know, like the other one is the one that gets hurt, even if they already know that they shouldn't even be in that relationship. Yeah, and I actually I went through something like that last year before I met Sharon. I was in actually a relatively similar boat, so yeah. I totally get it. And I think that that's the one thing that resonates with me with this movie is that and we already talked about this before, but it's just how it mirrors my own life. And this is like the quintessential man in the 21st century. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it basically it, it's how we are as men. You know, we as a man, you're confused. You're confused with how your relationship with women, relationships with women work. Things go wrong. You try to do things different, but it's still not the right way. All being in a relationship is really is making mistakes until you find that right person. Yeah, uh, you make mistakes. You figure out maybe how to. Do, how to make them differently or how to decrease the number of them as you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately I feel like when you're looking for a relationship that's going to last a long time, you're looking for someone who satisfies the deficiencies that you have and vice versa. Absolutely. Uh, and the the broken parts of Rob can, I'm, I'm not saying that the person that, that whoever he ends up with is going to fix that. Um, but whatever he's missing can be satisfied or, or, or can be fulfilled by that person and vice versa. Um, Absolutely. We're focused on what, what Rob is lacking in this movie because he's the protagonist and it's his journey. Right. But if this movie had been told from Laura's perspective, we would have had a similar story. Absolutely. Because in what's crazy and one thing that we don't, we haven't touched on yet is that while Rob is going through these lists and he's going through his everyday life, Laura keeps coming back. Right. You know, she, she, is, she, she is moving out as slow as possible. <laughs> absolutely. And then, and then she ends up getting together with probably one of the most laughable characters in this film. <laughs> oh. Ray. Yeah, Ian Ray, right? Yeah, the guy that lives upstairs or downstairs. He lived upstairs, and they could hear them have. They could always hear him having sex. Yeah, whenever Laura and Rob lived together, they could hear Ray having sex. Yeah, and once Rob sort of pieces it together because he talks to Laura's sister, right? Her friend. Her friend. Yeah, her friend. Played played by his sister. Right. That's Joan what it is. Yeah, played by Joan Cusack. Who is um, amazing. She is always great in everything she's for in. For sure. Yeah. And I, so think he, this is, and I think this is the second time that they've been in a movie together because the first time was 16 Candles. Right. So Laura's uh, friend is named, do you remember her name? Liz. Her name is Liz. Liz, yeah. Uh, so Rob talks to Liz, and Liz is both of their friends, as happened, you know, this happens in relationships. Yeah. She, um, she was um, um, Laura's friend first, and she likes Rob. And she likes Rob with Liz, uh, and, and with Laura, and she, Laura, and, that's yeah, what I mean. and she likes Rob enough to try to figure out what's going on, so she can try to be his friend uh, right. as well. So Until. whenever, <laughs> right, and we will get to that in a moment. Uh, and so he uh, talks to her, and through his conversations with Liz, he's able to piece together that Laura has 
moved in with this guy, Ian, who lives upstairs. And that scene is excellent. It's so uh, hilarious. And I'm going to play that clip, too. I know we're playing a lot of clips, but it's just so good. <laughs> It really is, and this is one of those movies where you can we can get away with doing that because it's just that damn good. Yeah, and so this is the scene where Rob is in bed that night, and he is imagining his uh, he's imagining Laura having sex with Ian. She goes on long enough. Mm-hmm. I should be so lucky. Abandoned and noisy as any character in a play. I'm lost. You are Ian's plaything, responding to his touch with shrieks of orgasmic delight. No woman in the history of the world is having better sex than the sex you are having with Ian in my head. Give it up. Uh, okay, and so now um, he. Rob, the, I think the next big emotional beat of the movie that we have to get to is something that we just alluded to. And that is when he, when Liz comes into the store and uh, just calls him an asshole because we find out Rob not only kind of cheated on Laura, but his blase attitude kind of had her make a decision to get an abortion. Right. So there's a scene and it's another one that I'll play because I'll never do it justice, but it's where he says, uh, you might be wondering what that's about. I get the feeling that Liz talked to Laura and Liz stuck up for me. And Laura told her a few things. I don't know what precisely Laura said, but she would have revealed at least two, maybe even all four of the following pieces of information. One, that I slept with someone else. You slept with somebody else? What? While she, Laura, was pregnant. While I was pregnant? No! Two, that my affair directly contributed... Pretty much directly to me terminating the pregnancy. No. Three, that after the abortion, I borrowed a large sum of money from her. Four grand or so? And have not, as of yet, repaid any of it. Four, that shortly before she left me, I told her that I was kind of unhappy in the relationship and maybe sort of looking around for someone else. He was sort of maybe looking around for somebody else. Did I do and say those things? Yes. No! Yes, I did. I am a fucking asshole. I think this is also where this was the second time where I was like, man, this guy's a piece of shit. Like, yeah. she was right to dump his ass. Yeah, and so at, at this point, I think it's I think it's important to talk about the balancing act that this narrative strikes or, or plays because it is a tall order to make someone as unlikable as Rob should be likable. Right. And so if you look at the way that this story is told, and this is equal parts, I think, Nick Hornby's original story and John Cusack's ability to deliver this character, Mm -hmm. uh, you get just enough of Rob being sympathetic and honest and deprecate, self-deprecating. And then they hit you with some of this hard truth And so now it forces the audience into this crazy moral dilemma over how to feel about this guy. Right. And I think part of what does it, I think it's him looking for self-reflection that makes him likable in the face of these facts that he's really not a likable person. Right. And, and that is, and that is why the breaking the fourth wall talking to the audience works for me in this movie, I think, because he, he's not talking to us. 
he's reflecting, like he's talking to himself. We right. are just privy to that, right? And and so it's delivered as a monologue, but it could very well just be like an internal monologue. Absolutely. And I sort of think that that's because, you know, what's funny is that I've kind of done this when I'm trying to figure things out and I sort of talk to myself. But it's like, wow, if this were a movie, I'd be breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I like that in this movie. It totally works for me. It um, really does. And so the second act of this movie is largely focused on Rob's journey into the past to try to figure out what went wrong with all of these relationships. Oh, uh, that is so hilarious. Yeah, he's, so he's recounted his top five. And now he is going to track down all five of these women to try to figure out uh, where he went wrong. And if you've been paying attention, even if you haven't seen this movie, you know where he went wrong in most of these places. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing was, he really, like I said, but I think deep down, he knew. Yeah. He just needed validation. And honestly, I think he needed to get beat up a little bit because... You need to take him down a couple of pegs. Even. Right, because if you look at all of those old relationships, uh, the Catherine Zeta, he was dumped by Catherine Zeta-Jones. He was dumped by the girl that came after that. But uh, the one that he was really the shittiest to... Uh, he was more worried about why she rejected him for sex, and then after, he bro after they broke up, well, he broke up with her, she went and had sex with someone else. Right, immediately, like the next guy. Yeah, and and she's carried that decision. The fact that she was so brokenhearted, she let someone essentially take advantage of her. Because in that scene, she says it wasn't rape because I didn't say no, but it wasn't far off. Right, and it's like he's so busy saying, "Well, why did you do this to me?" Without him being like, "Wow, what did I do to you?" Right, and and it's it, I think it's the conversation with that second girl that uh that starts to wake him up a little bit and and put the, uh, put a little bit more of the honest on him to own his mistakes and own his decisions yeah and and can we just say i was really pissed off with that quick arc he had where he hooked up with um mrs call drago lisa bonet Oh, that annoyed you know, the hell out of me. Uh, that's going to keep you from giving it a perfect shot rating, isn't it? Uh, I mean, not really because it was the character. It was character driven. It wasn't just. Yeah, you can be mad at Rob the person for that. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I really was. That, that's where I was like, I was rooting for Laura to yeah. just completely stay away from him. Because it got to a point where. Let me set the stage for you guys. He's been stalking Laura to the point where Ian, a.k.a. Ray, Ian Raymond, a.k.a. Raymond, played by Tim Robbins, shows up to the video store. Who's so good. He really is. And Tim Robbins is another one who's he's great in everything. He, he, he offers does. like a really nice slice of levity in this film that, like, even though it's funny, can get kind of heavy. Right. And the thing is about him is that he seems like the nicest guy, very patient, but it, it, there's just something unlikable about him. He's just smug. Yeah, he's very smug. But and then he's, he he's goes, sort of cast as um that like kind of uh hippie, like the smug hippie sort I'm of trope. better than I'm better than you nonviolent hippie guy. Yeah, and uh and I have a theory about this. Okay. Um, because there are... I, you're going to have to follow me down the rabbit hole for a second. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with but, you. But I think that it is totally on point. So, I'm and I will you. cite my evidence. So, I believe that in certain aspects of Rob's recollections of the story, we have to acknowledge that he could be unreliable. Um, and so in a story that is absolutely one of the more realistic depictions of like male 
interactions with romance that I've seen in film. Mm-hmm. That's how you have someone like Ian come across as almost a caricature because <laughs> he is the other guy. And if you've ever been the other guy to someone like Ian, then you create this sort of over the top caricature of all of the things that are terrible about him in your brain. And so that's <laughs> that I feel like what we see of Ian through Rob's eyes is not really what it would it's not really accurate maybe because think of the times that we really see Ian. We see Ian in what Rob is assuming is this intense sex that he's having with Laura which is all imagined. Right. And we see Ian come into the record store and uh in a series of fantasies where it's hilarious. <laughs> and each one just gets more over the top right. and violent. Right. It's so where gross. like in one in the first fantasy, Rob just starts yelling at him. In the second fantasy, like Dick hits him in the face with a telephone, like just and, out of nowhere. It's right. Like, and, really? <laughs> right. And so the fact that there are these fantasies involved there. And Dick uh, it actually takes it to the next level rips the air conditioner out of the window <laughs> right it slams it on his face right yeah absolutely and so outside oh, of I... those moments the only time you see ian is when laura talks on the phone with rob when she's at his when she's at ian's place but i'm not even really sure that you see him in that scene you hear his voice no i think so, you do see him because they sit down to dinner yeah, but but all all I'm saying is that from Rob's perspective, of course, Ian would be dialed up to a to a caricature, caricature, and he's the only one in this movie that really feels like he's not completely fleshed out as a three dimensional character. Right. Here and I think are they, my I other know. here are my other supporting pieces of evidence for this. Okay. Um, there. So you have those two examples of the of the fantasy. Uh, then you have this moment early on, which is one of my favorite moments. Uh, where he starts talking about how it's like a Bruce Springsteen song, and oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Bruce like and he actually talks to Bruce in this weird fantasy moment, right? And he's like, uh, and then I'll feel better about myself. And he goes, uh, and he and, and Rob says, I'll feel better about myself. They'll feel better about themselves, and everybody will be better. And Bruce says, Well, you. They'll feel better about themselves, maybe, but you'll feel better about yourself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and he's like strumming the guitar, and it's this, and and so there are these moments where Rob projects some sort of a fantasy element into the movie, an imagined element to it. That's one. Then there's this. Uh, well, you know moment. the delete. Well, you know the deleted scene of that. You know what happened, right? I I don't. I've never well, watched the deleted scenes. Well, while while Bruce Springsteen is like strumming up his guitar. Courtney Cox is, um, you know, doing her little dance while Dolph Lundgren is standing behind her with his sword drawn. <laughs> they, hey, well, they finally made it to Jersey, right? Yeah. Uh, man, that is a deep cut for anybody that is still with us on this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> really so, is. Um, right. So then the and this is my last piece of evidence. And this is an, uh, a good moment, I think, to sw- segue into. Uh, another conversation but there's a moment where he where later rob is talking to laura and he says uh he asks her if she's had sex with ian and she says i haven't had sex with ian yet and he walks out of his (laughs) apartment building with we are the champions playing (laughs) with his hands over his head and like he can hear the soundtrack right and so there are these moments where the fourth wall breakage is so intense that it almost becomes fantastical, you know? That's so and awesome. which which lends to the air of reflection, uh, but also lends to the air of uh of unreliability at times. Now, I think that he's unreliable in his depiction of Ian, but I believe that because of his amount of honesty about other things, we can ultimately trust him in the way that he's relaying most of these events. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also the best part about the whole thing in this regard is (laughs) I I can't even stop laughing because every scene with uh, Tim Robbins is just so hilarious, but it really is. It's it's just it's so I, I I just I can't get off the fact just how well done it was 
and how yeah he, he he keeps proving how unreliable he is how childish he is yeah how just silly he is with all the things he's done but at the same token he is still really really likable because he's still trying hard to like be better and that's figure what things it is out. And it's and and that's what may even with all of this stuff that he pulls, it's like he's even though he's self-destructive, he's grasping for self-improvement. And I think one of the great things that he does, and you start learning you you meet these two characters that are shoplifting from the store. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a very important part to this plot because he sees something in these kids. That you know, they're shoplifting multi genre albums, right? And uh, magazines about recording and stuff, yeah. And he starts to realize that these kids are just trying to find their ways in life the same as he is, right? And so he hears music that they make playing over the speakers in the store. Uh, they brought in a tape for uh, Jack Black to play, and they play it over the speakers and Rob comes in and hears it. And he says, who is this? And he's like, it's those two kids out there. And uh, Jack Black is like beside himself. He's like, it's really fucking good. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so Rob then, uh, well, uh, we are a little bit ahead of ourselves on that um, to, to get to that part, because I I do want to talk about this, uh, a few things that happened between here and there. But yeah, so the kids come in and steal that stuff, and then you think that maybe that's going to be it for them, but they do come back around later. Right. Um, he goes to see uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and really the big takeaway there is that she's boring and that she's really – there's nothing of substance there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But she calls him on a shit, right? Um, she is the one that calls him on his whole, like, what does it all mean thing. Um, right. And she actually goes – Please don't tell me you're doing this this thing. I mean, he was like, no, no, I, I just right. I just want to be friends and blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, oh, my God, you really are doing it. Right. He was also, and I thought this was excellent, astounded that she was listed in the phone book. <laughs> yeah. Because, because he had put her on such a pedestal in his memory that, you know, of course someone like Catherine Zeta-Jones wouldn't just be in the phone book. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God, she's really in the phone book. It's like, right. So he goes yeah. to this stuffy dinner party at her place and realizes that she's just empty and that he was that she was just really hot and anything. And that's that all she, she had going for. Her. She was a pretentious. She's a very very pretentious person. Yeah, and so he was smitten, which made everything that came out of her mouth sound interesting. Uh, right. But really, now that he's a little bit older and can sort of see through that stuff, he he knows that that's just not the case. And and you hit it on the head and and that is that what what i think this movie how this movie speaks to me is because it is a perfect depiction of that moment in that we hope all men come to where they look back over their lives at the at the people that they've hurt and they try to figure out where they went wrong and how to move forward now i don't know that i can stand by the the premise that we should all go back through our history and talk to all of those people because those people are probably doing fine without us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, a life lived without reflection is not a life with any kind of significant growth. Agreed. And I think that a lot of that is, and I think that, you know, there's times where I still, I look back at a lot of my past relationships and I do try to look for different patterns in my behavior so I don't bring that behavior into my current relationship. And I think that's something that we all do in our own way. And I think that Rob is, you know, he's now that he's in this growing phase where he's finally taking that plunge to be successful. And one of the things that he does in that regard is he actually offers to produce and record the shop list. Right. And and I wanted to talk about a scene between him and Laura that I think sort of pushes oh, right. him. To yeah, do that. because yeah, because he actually he has his big come to Jesus moment before that, right? Well, there's a moment where he walks in and she's still slowly moving out, and she's found 
a journal or, or a letter or something that he wrote where it, he has, he's listed his top five uh, dream jobs. Right. And these dream jobs are like really ambitious, like Rolling Stones reporter, um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so she <laughs> said she asks him what happened to this guy that, you know, was willing to dream like this. Yeah. He was like, or I'll just end up working in a record store. Right. And I think that that conversation is absolutely one of those moments that pushes him to take a chance on these kids once he hears their music. Right. And I think that a big part of it, and this is something that we learn about, Rob, is that for, you know, someone that tries really, really hard to, I guess, be this smart guy, this really important guy. He's really just scared. Yeah. He's scared to fail. He's afraid to he's afraid to make that attempt and miss. He's afraid to shoot for the moon because instead of the idea, and this is something that Sharon and I have talked about before. Yeah. You know, even when we were when I when you and I first talked about the idea of doing the plot of Hollux. Yeah. And I went to Sharon. I said, you know what? I don't know because blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. And I said, you know, and, I, and I've said this about a few things. And I said, you know, I don't want to shoot for the stars and land on Earth. I mean, I don't want to shoot for the moon and land on Earth. And right. she goes, well, what if you shoot for the moon and you land on the stars? Right. And I you think know, that that's something that and that was his moment right there. There's this. Uh, do you watch BoJack Horseman? I love BoJack Horseman. So there's this really great moment where BoJack, uh, who, as you know, was the star of a 90s sitcom, but who is kind of down on himself because he never got the, at least early on, he had never gotten the chance to be a serious actor. He'd just been a sitcom actor. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, Diane, who was writing his memoirs at the time, uh, says, you know, most people don't ever even get to do the horse and around version of their dream. Right. Uh, and that's that same concept, right? Like you and I are, are like that. You know, we may never be uh, published by a big five publisher, but we still write books and we still get published and people still read our stories. Right. Uh, exactly. And that's where Rob is because he wants to be in music. And so he finally takes a chance and somewhere in the midst of all of this, he gets a phone call from Laura who is crying. And this because... is probably the most, one of the most beautiful scenes where he actually, Rob is a person now. He's yeah. not just this asshole. He's right. a good dude. We've seen him in enough situations at this point that we, that he's completely fleshed out as a character. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, Laura's, yeah, father, so Laura's father has died. And Laura's and, father really liked Rob to the point where she didn't tell her father any of the negatives about Rob. Yeah. You know, he thinks they're still together and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. And she's crying and she turns to Rob to she calls Rob to invite him to the funeral. But you also see, I think that. She turns to Rob because she had, even though they've broken up, she she hasn't moved on to the point that she has a, a an emotional replacement yet. Uh, right. And so, as is the case often when unexpected tragedy hits, we turn to those people that we are most comfortable sharing ourselves with. Right. Because she didn't even tell. She didn't tell Ian. Right. She, she went, went to Rob. Right to Rob. And Rob, who is bitter with her shows his growth at this point because he he genuinely responds and respects this moment exactly and i think that i think this is where finally we can start to forgive rob for his shortcomings yeah because he he's not a condescending prick now he actually shows that he has a heart he can be he, he's the person that Laura sort of fell in love with. And and as much as we all like to say that, you know, this chick, 
you know, dumped me. She moved into the upstairs apartment with this dude, Ian, who is insufferable. Fuck her. I'm never going to talk to her again. Uh, you know, if she calls me and needs me, I'm going to tell her where to stick it. You know, we all like to say that. But when these people call us and need us, it is impossible not to remember what they meant to us. Right. And I think that, that, that that's that's a great point. And I think it also sort of pulls to a lot of us as men, we have that chivalrous side. We have that side where even if it's someone that's that we that we loved at one point that's hurt us or we've hurt, we are beyond willing to come to their rescue. Right. And that's real and or just to be there for them. And that's what Rob does. Rob does the chivalrous thing. But the, and the great thing, and I'm glad that they didn't do this, because even at, although at the time, with the time, I wouldn't have been surprised. He's not there trying to fix her problems. Right. He's just there supporting her. He's there because she asked him to be. He doesn't sit with her at the funeral. He do, he tries to just kind of blend in to the surroundings. And that was uh, the most admirable admirable thing that he could. Yeah. Heard. Now there's some tension that that crops up at the uh, reception that they have after the funeral back at Laura's mom's place. Yeah, because her mom knows about all the BS, you know. Yeah, and so he decides that he's just going to duck out, and mm-hmm. and he leaves when you know the conversation turns negative. Mm-hmm. And um, again, Rob is hanging out outside in the rain. And, and when he sees her coming, <laughs> why the hell can't he hop a fence, Shane? Yeah, right. So well, I know why. Laura, he can't, can't so jump. he sits on this bench at, I guess, what is a bus stop. Yeah. Uh, and he covers up his head with his jacket because it is pouring. And then Laura pulls up in the car at the stop sign, like just down the way from the bus stop. And he sees her before she sees him. So he's like, oh, I'm going to hide so that she doesn't see me in the rain. And he tries to hop this fence and just face plants in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and, and when that happened, I heard Dave Chappelle in Robin Hood Men in Tights. Man, white men can't jump. Right. Well, he definitely couldn't. Uh, nope. And at the same time, you know, it's just there's so much to be said about like there's this there's this book that I use in my you know, literature classes sometimes called How to Read Literature Like a Professor. Right. And uh, there's a chapter uh, there. Well, several of the chapters sort of take very common symbols. Um, and this one is this is an interesting moment because the the book and I don't have a copy of it with me or I would cite the author, but he essentially makes the argument that rain is commonly used in film uh, or in literature as to signify cleansing. Okay. Uh, and, but it can be complicated by the presence of mud, right? So the fact that they have Rob fall into the mud, it's almost like every time he's in the rain and he's in the rain so much, it's, it <laughs> indicates this attempt at cleansing, but he just can't quite get it right. Right. Uh, and so he always just ends up in the mud, uh, in spite of his best <laughs> efforts. Right. And so Laura sees him and calls him over to the car and they drive off to this place where she used to go with her dad all the time. Yep. And, and they park there for a moment. And I, and that's when they finally, you know, they decide that they're gonna, well, they, 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 they share some intimacy and I'll tell you something right now. I looked over at Sharon. I was like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and I want, cool. and I'm going to play this clip too, because again, it's another just really powerful moment. Is there anything I can do? Come on. Where? I'll show you. Let's go. Dad used to bring us here when we were kids. Listen, Rob, would you have sex with me? I want to feel something else than this. It's either that, or I go home and put my hand in the fire. Unless you want to stub cigarettes out on my own. No, I only have a few left. I've been saving them for later. 
Oh, the freaking romance, man. Yo, and like, and it's such a real moment too, because this is not, this is not John Cusack standing outside the window with a boom box. This is, this is just what grief does to people. It just sends you, it, it, it sends you looking for comfort somewhere. And this is not, I don't, I don't even read this particular scene as an, att- I think that they have a conversation about getting back together afterward. Right. Uh, but this moment is really just about these two people, sh- her just wanting to feel something other than sad for a minute or two. Yeah. And um, it also, and it also proves their connection and it was much, much deeper than I think either one of them realized. And because she was in her grief, she wasn't able to like, I guess, hide from it. Yeah. It was like she gave herself over to it because she wanted that feeling. Yeah. Uh, And it's a powerful scene and it's not a glamorous sex scene. Not even close. And I don't think, and honestly, if it was a glamorous sex scene, it would have tainted the movie. It would have yeah. tainted the movie. Yeah, it, it was it was clumsy and it was awkward and it was so very human. And real, because I mean, come on. I've tried to have sex in a car. It right. didn't work out very well. Yeah. Uh so it's so then uh, you know, he uh takes her back or they she goes back home uh and he asks her to come back to the apartment. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it when it's all passed, and she starts to move her things back in, and this is where she decides that she's going to plan an album release party for these uh, two guys that Rob has been producing. Yep, and um, Jack Black's band, and we haven't talked about Barry in so long. I almost forgot his name. His new band, which what's funny is that he's had a sign for. A band for two years, they said, and he's turned. He's just like finally someone comes and talks to him about it, and he tries to act so blasé about it. Yeah, the you know, um, I'm glad that you that we got back to Barry because we do need a Barry Dick update here uh, as we approach the end of this thing. Um, because Barry, yeah, so Barry, some rando dude comes in and decides that there he's going to let Barry audition to sing with him, uh, <laughs> and they decide to make they they create a band called Sonic Death Monkeys, <laughs> uh, which is brilliant because it establishes a very specific expectation for what they're going to sound like, and they defy that. <laughs> yes, very much so. Very um, very. Oh, much that's so. what it, I, I remember. The the second band, he says. Uh, at the end during their live show, uh, Barry says, we are formerly known as Sonic Death Monkey, currently working on becoming Kathleen Turner Overdrive. But for <laughs> tonight, you can call us Barry Jive and the Uptown Five. <laughs> Which was so great, though. I mean, and what's amazing is that so she has Rob DJ because Laura and Rob met when he was a DJ and he was good at it and he loved it. So she's, she's forcing him out of his comfort zone. Mm -hmm. She's forcing him into a level to where he has to succeed. And he wants to reject it so bad. He, and and honestly, he starts to self-sabotage because he meets this, this uh, magazine writer and I'm screaming at the screen at this point. Cause I'm like, Rob, stop. And yeah. What's funny is that Laura recognizes the pattern, and yeah. she just and she just lets him go there, because I think she's she's just happy to have someone. Not not it's not even just a familiarity; it's like she truly loves him, and she's willing to just let him have his faults. You know what it is? I've I've thought a lot about this. Um, I've thought a lot about this last chunk of this movie as I've gotten older and had similar patterns. I think that she's willing to stick around at the end of this thing because I think that she sees that she is his end game. Um, And she just has to 
be patient okay. enough for him to figure that out. Uh, that yeah, and, and, and that's exactly what I meant. It's like, that's exactly what I mean when we've yeah. come to that same conclusion. It's like he's, he's circling the drain and, it, and it, it, you know, because all these other relationships ended and that was the end of that story. But with Laura, they keep coming back to each other. They and, can't get away from each other. Right. And there's this there's this gravity in their relationship that I think tells Laura that if she can weather just a little bit more of this bullshit, that he's going to be the man that she needs. needs. Right. And because she's already the woman he needs. She's that sense yeah. of stability that he needs. He, yeah, and and she's she's the light in the darkness for this guy. She's she's the she's the one with the power to to save him from himself. Right, and so she sees the him falling into patterns of infidel, you know, looming infidelity and self sabotage because he tries to get the, the the two kids not to be involved. He tries to keep Barry from being involved. He tries to like argue with her and then he starts with this other woman and she is still just as loving, just as supportive. And I think that's what wakes him up. But she does call him on it. Oh, absolutely. Which is, I think, the difference, right? Because when they break up the first time and we learn about all of the stuff that has happened in their relationship up to that point, we, we I think, learn that maybe they neither of them were very good at communicating with each other. But this time is different because this time she walks in and he's making a mixtape and she goes, oh, is that for the girl from the paper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she and he's like, uh, 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 and she already has the answer. And she's just sitting there enjoying watching him squirm. Yeah. Because and, she knows she caught him. He right. knows that she caught him and he's like, he can't rationalize his way out of it. Yeah. And that, and that realization in that moment brings us to the John Cusack moment of the movie, <laughs> which is uh, at this table at this bar uh, or restaurant where he asks Laura to marry him. Yeah. And it is the worst proposal. But it uh, would be them. It would not be them. It if was, it was pute, if it was like right. fancy and romance. It was. It was. It was just so honest, was, yeah, you know, and genuine. And and he talks about. He, and here we go back to my original theory from a while ago. He talks about the fantasy. He right. says, you know, like, and, but I realize now that all of that is just the fantasy. And but what I want is you, right? And um, he. I don't know. I think that's a really great scene. And you know what? We've play played it. a lot of clips, but let's play it. What are you going to talk to me about? Um, I'm going to talk to you about whether or not you want to get married to me. <laughs> I, I'm serious. Yes, I know. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was a, two days ago you were making tapes for that girl from The Reader. Well, forgive me if I don't think of you as the world's safest bet. Would you marry me if I was? <laughs> what brought all this on? I don't know. I'm just sick of thinking about it all the time. About what? This stuff. Love and settling down and marriage, you know. I want to think about something else. I changed my mind. That's the most romantic thing I've ever heard. I do. I will. Just shut up, please. I'm just trying to explain, okay? that other girl or other women, whatever. I mean, I was thinking that they're just fantasies, you know? And they always seem really great because there's never any problems. And if there are, they're cute problems. Like, you know, we bought each other the same Christmas present or she wants to go see a movie that I've already seen, you know? And then I come home and you and I have real problems and you don't even want to see the movie I want to see, period. And, there's no lingerie. And, I have lingerie. Well, yes, you do. You have great lingerie, but you also have the cotton underwear that's been washed a thousand times and it's hanging on the thing. And, and they have it too. It's just I don't have to see it because it's not the fantasy. Do you understand? I'm tired of the fantasy. And you know what's crazy? And we've talked about this. Yeah. This mirrors my life so much because, <laughs> again... There's all this fantasy in th this day and age of the internet. Yeah. Fantasy is everywhere. 
Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know what? At the end of the day, fantasy doesn't put up with my bullshit. Who, you know, right. Who, who is the person that you are going to need when grief comes? Like, that's one of the big questions here, right? Because mm -hmm. we will all face tremendous grief in our life. Mm -hmm. And it is made immeasurably easier if we have a partner there who can support us through that time. And, Absolutely. and we see that. Uh, illustrated beautifully with Laura and Rob in this film. And I think that those moments, even though Rob isn't experiencing that grief, I think that that is another one of those wake up calls that he's able to be there for her, that he's able to be that support that she needs because look, man, it doesn't matter how strong you are. Like we all are weak sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I, And I think that at the end of the day, for as unromantic as it is, it is the most real. And the, and that's one thing about this film that we can easily say. This movie is real. It's and, really not a romantic comedy as much as it's a case study in healthy companionship. <laughs> absolutely. because And what's funny is that this film definitely showcases a, kid, a Chris Rock comic routine. You got commitment and new pussy. Right. New yeah. pussy. I mean, commitment might give you a headache and new pussy might make you smile. But is new pussy going to teach my kids to read? New pussy's illiterate. Right. You know? So yeah, what do I do? I turn this commitment of old pussy into new pussy. That's what that, you do. And, you that's and at the end, that's what this does. It's like, look, I may get bored with the routine. And it's almost like, Rob self-sacrifices because he's afraid of taking the chance. But it almost seems like the the, the, the self-destructive behavior is almost like thrill-seeking. Yeah, and you know, um, I... Uh, hold on one second. Um, I was having to make a note. Um, so the thing that uh, you just you just mentioned how the cycle... You, you were talking about new pussy and how you got to make the old pussy new pussy right mm -hmm. and start the cycle over again and that's such a really great and crass point uh because <laughs> it really is crass it's right crass. because uh every relate well the big relationships that we see uh in rob's adult life start with a mixtape uh he made laura a tape when they met when he was djing uh yeah he is making the journalist at the paper a tape. And at the end of the movie, he's back at his stereo and he says, this time when I make a mixtape, it's, it's for Laura. And he's starting it over again. That's how they met. He's going back to the basics, right? Like the, it's like they're starting from scratch. Um, and, and the way that the movie ends, he says, it'll be for Laura. He flips that switch and I believe when I fall in love with you, it will be forever starts playing. And the last thing I want to talk about is that soundtrack. <laughs> this movie has a banger of a soundtrack. Oh, man, it really does. And this movie, it's, it's a gem. It really is. It's a gem. It's, it's, it's one of those movies, again, you know what? If you're a parent and or a sibling of, of a young man you need to have them watch this movie yeah you truly do and you want to know something i have to i have to make this point real quick april and this is courtesy of wikipedia in april 2018 abc signature studios announced that it was developing a television series adapt adaptation of high fidelity with Midnight Radio, Scott Rosenberg, Jeff Pinkner, Josh Applebaum, and Andre Nemec. Rosenberg will return to script the series, which will feature a female lead in the Cusack role. I saw this news, and I don't know how to feel about it. <laughs> yeah, and Zo what's funny, though, Zoe Kravitz is going to play the lead, which sort of is a connection to her mother being in the, the movie. Yeah. Um, it was she should be good in it. I mean, like, it's gonna be on Hulu. 
Okay. I mean, I'll watch it. I'll give it a shot. I would much rather be, I would much, I would be much more interested in the same story being told from Laura's perspective. Now that would be awesome. But honestly, uh, I don't think script writers these days know how to do that. Yeah, that that it would be tough. It'd be a tall order, but I would have loved to have seen that movie. Absolutely. Um, all right, man. Hey, it is about that time. Let's get into the ratings. If you are unfamiliar with our rating system, I'll go ahead and let Smiley the bartender tell you about it. I love Smiley. The Plotaholics rating system for the movies is a pretty simple system. Basically, they rate movies based on how many shots it takes to get through them. So if you got a good movie and you get through it all the way sober, then it takes zero shots to get through the movie. And then if you got a really bad movie, then it could take up to five shots to get through the whole thing. I think you can try to figure out the middle part yourself. So what can I get you? All right, and let's get into it. Um, I think we all know how I feel about this thing, so we'll start with you, Brian. Um, how do you feel about high fidelity zero to five shots you know what i can't eat i'm not even gonna i'm going with a zero yeah um i i love to hate rob i hate to love rob but at the same token i am rob that was me when i was 20 that hell that was me when i was 30 hell in a lot of ways it's still me now you know and where this movie doesn't do things right, it's part of the charm. It's part of the charisma. These characters make you invested in them. This is a film that feels so much like a great indie film. Yes. It, it, the storytelling, the pacing never slows down. It never feels like it lulls. There's not a soggy middle to this movie. Not at all. The, the the tone is the same from beginning, middle, to end. And God bless Touchstone's pictures for this film. I mean, you know, now they're a part of the Disney conglomerate. Yeah, you, when, when you talk about this movie, like, it's just... You can try to quibble with things about it, but casting, soundtrack, cinematography, direction, storytelling, I have no problems with this. I'm a zero shotter, too. And to echo something that you said about this, uh, it doesn't matter. You said uh, it, 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 you've been Rob. You are in many ways Rob today. Mm -hmm. The charm of this movie, especially from a from a, a perspective where uh, from a masculine perspective that isn't afraid to challenge himself and isn't afraid of self reflection. Mm -hmm. Uh this movie, and this is how I've been able to watch it every year for like a decade and a half, you know, mm -hmm. is that because it shows you Rob from middle school, high school, college, young adult, adult, business owner, chasing his dreams. Like it's sh like it, you are Rob because we get every version of a person out of him right we see his entire life in a really genius way that never feels like they're bogging us down in exposition and so it doesn't matter where you are in life there's something to glean from rob's experiences absolutely and this is a movie for a young man this is a movie for a middle-aged man this is a movie for an older man this yeah, because is i think once you even age out of the rob paradigm like once you've matured and you've got your family and everything's humming for you, you can still get enjoyment out of this film because that used to be you. You used to be that jackass. Exactly. And everyone has a strong character arc. Everyone gets their moment in the sun. Um, and I think that those that don't, it's a reflection on life of people coming yeah. into your life for a season. And that is why I'm okay with the uh, Lisa Bonet uh, plot, subplot. Yeah. Uh, because I'm... she is absolutely just a rebound fuck, right? Like, she just pops in and pops out. That's what she does. That's her role in his life. And, and she even recognizes that. And he's yeah. the same thing for her. Yeah. 
And there's so many times that people pop in and pop out of our lives just like that. Um, it doesn't make it good or bad or anything. It just makes it, it just is. It just makes it part of the human experience. And can and can we just tell our we can we tell our listeners as well? This film is certified fresh with a score of ninety one percent on nice. Rotten Tomatoes. Hey, that's good, man. That's a big deal. Yeah, for it to be out for this long and for their for them to have had this much time to you know collect their reviews, ninety one is pretty good. Yeah, and I and I'll tell you something right now. This is just I am so grateful and thankful to finally experience this film because it's just powerful. Yeah. It it makes you like in a, in a kind of sneaky way. You know, like it really is because when I'm first watching this movie, it's like orange John Cusack. It's fun. It's cute. It's it's fun. And it's more than that now that I'm talking about it and I'm thinking about it. It's so much more than that. Yeah. It's it's so much more than your stereotypical Cusack movie. It really is. And uh I just everybody just really shines in this thing. No no complaints on casting whatsoever. No, I can't find anything wrong with anyone in this movie just for the simple fact that even Tim Robbins, who is, you know, he's there to be parody. Right. He's amazing. And everything, and you're right, you know, everything about this film is just great. Right, yeah. The So, um, yeah, man, so you heard it here, and I promise you guys we're not getting in the habit of doing a bunch of zero-shot movies. Absolutely um, not. Absolutely the, not. Although, I don't know, man, like the summer of Cusack offers us some more opportunities. Uh, I, I think so. And that, and that's the great thing about the summer of Cusack is that when you watch these movies and you, you know, you just sit down and you break them down like we do, you know, you, you find things that you didn't notice at first. And I like to think that we find things that critics miss because... I mean, I, I don't want to say that we're not jaded. We're jaded in our own way. Right. But at the same token, we are fans of film. Yes. And we're, you that know, and does it. We're, we are fans of film, but we are also creators of story. Right. And, and, and we can enjoy it. Yeah. And the fact that, that we work at the same factory in some ways means that that you know you sort of know how the sausage is made and i think that gives us an interesting insight uh i agree in 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 a lot of ways so yeah so uh that is going to do it for the zero shot rated john cusack classic exclamation point high fidelity point exclamation point absolutely we will see you back here in two weeks with brian's entry into the summer of cusack Oh, one crazy summer. Oh, Excellent. man. Starring, <laughs> spoiler alert, John Cusack. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you are not following us on Facebook or Twitter, we are at Plotaholics. Find us online at Plotaholics.com. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Podcasts. Wherever you listen to podcasts, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Leave us a review. Please uh, do. And, uh, and yeah, and, and you know what? If you're listening to us on YouTube, please click the red subscribe button, click the notification bell, so you get not so you get updated on when we update new content. We're updating new content almost every single day at this. Absolutely, point. yeah. You can get articles, written reviews. Uh, our weekly live stream will release on most Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Uh, on Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube live. So you want to be a part of that stuff. But uh, I think that's going to just about wrap it for us for this edition of the Plotaholics podcast. I'm Shane Wilson. And I'm Brian Tan. And we will see you again very soon. Take a trip with us to New Bar. Just promise not to drink the goo. If you get sucked into the matrix, 
Do you believe in fate? Sometimes the end game is the perfect place to start. We're in the end game now. And other times you want to pretend. The prequels were never a real thing. Let's just pod race to the end. It's working! Every movie has a plot hole. And every hole gets filled somehow. Just don't cut me off right now with a plot of holics. A breakfast club or two. We are the plot of holics. Ripping plots apart for you. Shane and Brian are an island. Misfit toys Wanting to be a Robocop Thank you for your cooperation Settling for Black Circle Boys And just like Dr. Hammond Extracting amber from wood And later there's running and then screaming A little too busy asking if we could And never asking if we should but every movie has a plot hole And every hole gets filled somehow With whiskey, wine, or blue milk Just don't cut me off right now With a plot of holics A breakfast club of two We're the Apart for you. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. <laughs>